Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. This is very real. Fantastic. This drug is dangerous. Wrong. You cannot play with it. It's not funny. It's, it's not something to laugh about. Good people don't smoke marijuana. Shut your little punk ass up. But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. 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 Hey, you guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Autoflower Podcast. Before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to Carl Jerome. Happy Days 58, Growing Higher, Andy, Katie and Hugh Jass, Mitch Dunlass, A, The Sacrificial Waffle, James B, Dan F, Coco Grows, Cincy Reefer, and Sean. Thank you guys so much for your support signing up on Patreon. If you're interested in checking out the Patreon, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash autoflowerpodcast, and you can check out the different tiers that are available to sign up there. Before we get started, I want to let you know that I do have a new discount code for you to use with SD Microbes, and I do make a small commission from this discount code, so another way to help out the podcast. Um, it's AF Podcast, and that's across the board at uh, SD Microbes website. The link is in the show notes. Um, you've probably seen me use, I actually just ordered some last week, uh, their Bokashi, which is off the hook, a great product. I've also been using their BioVast compost, which has been working really well also. I've made it into a tea, and I've also added it... Um, some peat moss and some aeration to make my own potting soil and so far it's been great so af podcast at sd microbes if you want to save yourself 10 percent on their products i've also got a pretty big 420 giveaway going on or it's going to be going on on instagram so keep an eye out for that i'm going to be giving going to be partnering up with some companies and giving away some really cool stuff including a light from our guest today Um, i've reached out and auto pot has offered to um, give away a four pot system through the podcast Uh, nature's living soil is in on it they're going to be giving away some stuff So um, it's looking really good. I'm excited to have a larger giveaway for you guys on 420. So be sure to check out the Instagram and keep an eye out there because that's kind of where I'm going to facilitate it and it's all going to be happening. So on this episode, we're going to be chatting with David from the Green Sunshine Company. Uh, They're a lighting company. They make LED lighting. They're based out of Oregon right here in the good old USA. And uh, we chat all things lighting. It's a great conversation. We chat about light stress. We chat about PPFD, uh, DLI. We chat about hanging heights, spectrum, uh, what lighting plants require throughout the different stages uh, of their lives. And speaking of that, you know, autoflowers actually require less lighting than traditional photo period plants. And I think a lot of us are probably blasting our plants with too much light. I think I was, and I think it may be possible that you might as well. And uh, that could potentially cause some issues that we may think has to do with something else. So um, that's a pretty key part of this conversation. Uh, We're going to get a lot more in-depth to that as far as the the particular lighting for autoflowers. Um, But I just wanted to really hope that you walk away latching on uh, to that nugget. That's what I walked away with the most anyways. So let's go ahead and get right into that conversation. Please welcome to the Autoflower Podcast, David from the Green Sunshine Company. So David, thank you so much, bro, for giving us your time and um, being here and willing to kind of educate us a little bit on lighting and things like that. I'm super excited actually to have you on. Um, If you could just give us a little bit of a background on yourself and uh, just introduce the company, that would be awesome. Yeah, thanks. 
Uh, thanks, Chad, for having me on. Um, my name is David. I am the president of the Green Sunshine Company. Uh, I've been with the company now for about four years. Um, been growing for about six. Um, funny thing is actually how I started with the company. Um, I actually won a grow light uh, through a contest. And at the time I was running a greenhouse and just decided, you know, I really love growing. I love weed. Why not give it a shot? And reached out to the owner and, you know, he had a spot for me at the time. And just started on the phones, helping customers, answering, you know, questions about growing. Um, that's really where my background really ramped up was, um, you know, talking to hundreds of growers, you know, a week about different problems in their garden. Um, you know, really kind of helped bring me up to the speed in a way that I really wouldn't have had access to. Um, mm. But that that's my role. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I like the idea um, that you guys are so hands-on with your customers. It sounds like uh, you'll you know, jump in and have, uh, conversations with them. Um, Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's nothing that really kind of gets us, um, happier than when we take a customer that's struggling, trying to get you know, the other seeds popped and, you know, they're sending us pictures months later of their harvest and, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're there enjoying that success with them. So that's very important to us. Yeah. That's good to hear, man. I feel like we need a lot more of that. Um, just in our modern day world in general, not even right. just in yeah, just restaurants and stuff. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> That's awesome. It's good to hear. Yeah. Um, so you guys off, obviously you offer lights, um, and grow lights, indoor grow lights, and you yeah. also offer some dry amendments actually for soil that you we call do. earth we dust. Can you tell me a little um, bit about that? Yep. So um, obviously, like I said, we started with lighting, um, but roughly about a year after that, um, Dan approached me about starting our own nutrient line, um, a dry amendment line. Both him and I are you know, living soil growers, so it was fell right into what we were familiar with. So it was really just kind of like coming up with a recipe that we felt was easy and simple to use. Um, you know, we knew there was lots of companies out there that were producing things that, you know, you could build your own soil and really kind of dive into making it your own. But we understand that your average grower isn't quite as familiar or might not really want to take that time. So we wanted to create a product that was very simple. Um, so that was our Earth Dust lineup. It is, you know, three applications. You know, you amend your you know, first soil to start with. You can pick whatever media you want. And then it's just two boost applications, you know, a week before flower and then 30 days later. Um, and it's a water only system. So it's really simple to use. Um, you can reuse your soil um, over and over again just by re-amending. Um, and it's just a really sustainable product because you know, it's the other part that we really try to lean into is being sustainable um mm -hmm. you know led lighting being you know more sustainable everything from all of our practices mm -hmm. um that's what we're about yeah i like it i um i have some i picked some up and um i love uh all the i was just taking a look at the ingredients in general and uh i noticed that a lot of the ingredients in there are some of the ingredients that I wish I would have bought from my, cause I bought all these down to earth dry amendments and yeah. uh, which isn't, <laughs> it's not going so <laughs> well for me. Um, but, uh, that's a huge learning curve. So I like the it idea really of, of that being packaged up and, and some of the, um, the stuff that's in there. I wish I would have gotten like the alfalfa and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to using it, man, and documenting it. Um, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a fun, a fun little uh, project for me. Um, to do another water only living soil type system. That's my thing. Yeah. It's right up my alley. So, um, yeah, now the only thing I will tell you is, um, you know, when we did the recipe, we, um, did the recommendations based for photo periods. Um, so for your application, one of the, the adjustments, um, and actually this was from our friend, um, full duplex actually hooked me up with some, uh, seeds to do some testing on the earth dust. Um, so I was able to do some testing to see, you know, when the best application rate was at what stage of growth. Um, mm. so what we did find was instead of doing, you know, a week before flower, because with auto flowers, that's, you know, you could be week three there. It's, mm -hmm. you don't want to be doing your first application. There. Um, you know, you really want to be looking at around like day 30, right? Right at that initiation of flower, um, kind of get those, um, nutrients set up at the, uh, the beginning there to help boost that. Uh, okay. Year. That's good to know, man. Yeah, so let's kind of um, get into this lighting thing a little bit, and uh, I think it would be good if we started by just defining some terms that we'll be using, um, in particular, like DLI and PPFD. Could you give us a rundown on DLI? Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, I'll start with PPFD, actually. 
Okay. Um, now, the way I'm going to describe it actually is, you know, I try to make things a little bit more understandable. Um, so PPFD, I want you to think of as like rain, right? And the rain is the amount of photons that is coming out of that light. And that is essentially the calculation of how many raindrops are falling from that light at one time. And at that point of measurement that you're taking. So that, that is the, essentially the PPFD is just the rate at which those photons are falling. DLI, we're going to think of as like the bucket. That is the daily accumulation of all that rain. So when you're calculating it, it's just trying to take how many of those photons have fallen throughout that day cycle, 12 hours, 18 hours, and accumulate it for a sum total. Um, so that's really how you're looking at it. It's how much rain is falling and how much is accumulated throughout the day. So what we do then is take those numbers and we try and base for whatever we're growing and figure out what the amount of that bucket needs to be to, to be its optimum growth rates because we don't want to be too much because then it's going to start having signs of toxicity or we don't want to be too little because then you're going to have you know, less yields or less growth. So it's really just finding that, ex that DLI is how much of that bucket do we need to get that plant to go throughout its full day and get everything it needs. So now, it's, I'm sorry. Go. Because uh, I, I just I got something in my head here. You said something about toxicity and it just kind of triggered a question and I don't want to forget it. Um, so it, too much light. Um, does that I've heard that uh, a lot of light will cause your plant to uptake more nutrients and stuff. Is that true? And is that what you mean by toxicity? Yes. So basically the way we got to look at it is that, you know, cannabis in general can take a lot of light. Um, it really doesn't have much of a limit. What we are limited in is our environment and our ability to push these nutrients. So in order for the plant to be able to take more of the light, you need to be able to have it uptake more nutrients. You have to be able to have it do all of these metabolic processes in turn with the amount of light you're giving. So if you're giving more light and it's metabolically processing faster than it's actually uptaking the nutrients, that is where you get the expression of chlorosis of the leaves and things like that happening because it just can't keep up. Hmm. That's interesting. And then, so if your light is way too far away and you don't have enough light hitting it and you've, and you're loaded with a lot of nutrients in your soil, that could cause a problem. That's it as well. Yeah. And that's okay. really why you've got to look at the whole process as like a, you know, homeopathic process. Look at the plant, the environment, your lighting, your nutrients, everything has to be within line. Um, I believe mm -hmm. it's Liebig's law is what they call it. It's the, the law of minimums. And basically your, your yields will always be to your lowest minimum. So if you have every, you know, great lights, your environment's locked in, but you know, you're lacking in nitrogen, your plant will never be able to reach those potentials of its nitrogen level. Mm -hmm. And that is the max it'll be able to hit. So it's really making sure that everything is in line to be able to maximize that usage. Okay. Yeah, so there's a balance, obviously. Um, see, this is why I wanted to have you on because lighting is is so important. I, in my, you know, previously, through most of my grow years, I haven't paid much attention to that. I just kind of throw a light in there, put it at whatever the manufacturer specifications are, and just let it roll. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, when doing that, um, if I'm off a little bit or or whatever, if I don't have everything dialed in, then deficiencies toxicities can show and sometimes it might not necessarily be the soil it could just be the lighting it, it's it's well it could be either one but it's those two things together right yes. is that kind of my yeah, understanding it, that correctly it's kind of what you, i mean everybody laughs at like the cow mag deficiency and you know the, all the memes that come with that but I, I, there's actually a lot of truth with that what they don't talk about is that there's 20 different variables that could be causing that lockout you know mm -hmm. you it's not a matter of needs more CalMeg. Could be a matter of too much potassium. Could be a matter of you know too much light. Could be all of these factors that are causing that. So you really have to look at the entire system. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so what is the best way to measure uh, before we like get into the depth of growing and stuff? Like, what is the best way to measure DLI or or PPFD? You know, um, a lot of these numbers um, are attainable through instruments. Um, so, you know, if you want to spend the money and get yourself a power meter and take measurements at, you know, certain levels of your grow, you can calculate your DLI almost exact. You know, I, auto flowers, I believe, you know, late flower, they like to have a DLI around like 40 to 50. Um, so 
you can really calculate it in, but there's other factors that you've got in play there. Um, for example, let's say we're trying to achieve an 800 PPFD at the top of my canopy. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can have a light that's higher intensity, that's higher up above your canopy, that is achieving an 800 power at that level, or a lower intensity closer to the canopy and right at that level. Well, there's a big difference between how you're gonna yield. And the reason for that is that cannabis is a 3D plant. It's not you know, a sheet of paper. So when you've got the rest of your canopy down below, there's a big difference between the amount of intensity coming through your canopy from that light that's a higher intensity, higher up above, achieving the same PPFD rating as a lower intensity, lower down below. So all of these factors play into when you're trying to do your calculations. So, you know, trying to say, you know, picking an exact number and being like, this is exactly where you should have it and you'll have no, no issues. I wouldn't say that, that that's the good way to look at it. So mm-hmm. the way that we try to coach our customers is we have, you know, our guidelines and, you know, what our PPFD readings of our light are. And we then recommend certain guidelines of hanging heights for each stage of growth. And what we try to do is teach how to read your plants, how to mm-hmm. read the signs of light stress, how to notice, like, when, you're, when your plant has hit its DLI, a lot of times you'll notice... Um, when you go in later in the day, you see your leaves starting to kind of sag down and, and droop down. A lot of times it's because they just hit their, their DLI for the day and they're, they're ready to go to bed. Um, mm. So it's just watching for signs like that that allow you to, to really narrow in exactly where the best place is for your light. Okay. Because yeah. if you don't have this environment dialed in exactly, you're not going to be able to hit that DLI. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting you say that about the leaves drooping because I experience that almost every day. So do you think that I'm giving a little too much light maybe? Or is it okay? Again, I I want to go back to where I don't want to say causation correlation. Uh, Uh, Yeah. You know, because your leaves drooping could be, you know, they'll they'll droop by every water. Yeah. You know, anytime you water, they're going to droop. So it's just taking a look at the whole thing, you know, knowing knowing if I just lowered my lights down, am I seeing some signs where they're looking a little wilted stress? Are they, Mm -hmm. are they showing those, those symptoms? I Um, gotcha. And, you know, if my leaves are nice, tilted up, praying, you know, I know that, you know, I'm sitting in a good spot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you look for things like uh, good signs to look for. Uh, tip burn, while also looking like it's starting to, to have some CalMag deficiency. Um, mm-hmm. you're, you're usually towards the top of the canopy. Um, if you're noticing that you're getting deficiencies towards the bottom and not the top of the canopy, probably not light toxicity. So it's just reading your plant, knowing what those signs are, and adjusting accordingly. Okay, that makes sense, man. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I want to get into, like, maybe if we can go through, like, a seedling stage, a veg stage, and a flower stage. Uh, Yeah, let's start out with the seedling stage. Like, what is the best lighting for for a seedling or, or, you know, the the PPFD um, for, for a seedling that just sprouted? It's just, you know, got the little first set of leaves and uh you know for for seedling seedlings you, you're really looking for very low ppfd um you're talking 100 to 150 ppfd um they do not need very much light because they're not metabolizing very much i mean mm-hmm. you're, you're talking a couple coidloidin leaves till your first true leaves um before you really start needing to even be looking at light intensity um now once you start getting to you know your seedlings have popped their first true leaves you're starting to get your real first node Um, that's when you want to start maybe cranking up to like 200 to 400 PPFD. Um, but anything before that, 100 to 250 PPFD, very minimal. Um, Mm -hmm. the, the key to that is kind of actually going opposite of what I was telling you about as far as the the higher light and and that intensity. Um, sometimes with the seedlings having a softer light, a little bit closer, um, you tend to get a little bit less stretch, um, and tends Mm -hmm. to, to react a little better. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is, is which, which is better? You know, a lot of people think, well, I'd like to save some money. Uh, there's no point in me, uh, you know, blasting this light full power for two tiny little seedlings and a, you know, a, a, a two by four, or a four by four tent. Um, <clears throat> so that was going to be my question. So it's okay to dim that light down and lower it um and as far as how much the ratio between dimming and and height you just if you have an instrument you just kind of nail it into that 100 to 200 ppfd and and just leave it so you can go really low and really low on the dimming as well and that's okay yes 
Yep, that's going to be good. Um, so now the only thing you want to be careful of is, like I said, once you start getting to that first set of true leaves or that first node, that's when you really want to pay attention to start increasing that intensity. Um, because you want to get your plant used to that increased intensity quickly. Um, because what happens a lot of times is you'll have people afraid, you know, they're in that seedling phase, everything looks good, they're keeping that low intensity, and then they'll, they'll start getting to that, you know, second, third node without really getting that intensity up, and they'll, they'll turn that intensity up to like a veg intensity. And mm -hmm. that big jump will then shock the plant and, and get it to kind of, you know, stay, you know, stop growing the, the way it should. Um, it'll stunt its growth um, by uh -huh. that large increase. So you probably so you really don't just want to kind of bring it up slowly mm -hmm. and uh, and start at that early stage. Okay, so you don't want to just go from one fifty to four hundred overnight, like like Correct. within an instant. You want to kind of yeah. gradually. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. And um, and then obviously, if 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 we have a light that doesn't have a dimmer, then you obviously want to hike that thing up to a height where it allows your seedling to be in that PPFD. Yeah. And most manufacturers will have recommendations for, you know, each stage of growth. Um, so if you can't find them online, you know, obviously you, you can call in. Um, you know, for us, we're, we're always available, but most manufacturers will, will have those listed. Okay. What are your thoughts really quick on, um, I, I, I paid for a phone app. I think it's called Photone or something. It's on my iPhone. It was like 25 yeah. or 30 bucks. Um, and basically, um, I calibrated that to my light based off of the manufacturer, manufacturer specifications. I would assume that that's obviously not extremely accurate, but do you so feel it that depends on, um, some of the devices will come with like a, a reader that you can plug into your phone. Um, mm. and if they actually have a, you know, par reader that you can plug in, they tend to be a little bit more accurate, but if it's just your phone reading it, all it's taking is a Lux reading. Um, and Lux is a terrible measurement for grow lights. Um, you, you know, you can have a flashlight that has a Lux reading that could blind you, but you know, it couldn't grow a hmm. basil. So, okay. Even if it says PPFD on my phone, that's, that's just a, is that just a, a translation? They are, they're, they're conversions of the Lux okay. into a PPFD. So it's probably not horribly accurate. Um, yeah. do you now, feel if, it would be if better? If you just... are talking a white light, if it's just white light diodes, um, actually it's not so bad because that is what the Lux is reading. It's reading white light um, because it's a measurement of what our eyes are perceiving. So the, the meters, if it's a, it's a white light, Lux reading, it's gonna be pretty accurate. Um, but if you have any sort of you know, deep red, infrared, UV, you, you're not gonna be picking any of that up. I see, okay. So if you're doing a larger grow, um, even at home, or if you're in a commercial atmosphere, it probably probably be beneficial and worth it to invest in a, a pretty decent uh, meter. Huh? Yeah, it can, it can really help. Like I said, for really, you know, the, the plant's a 3D plant. Um, mm -hmm. So you really want to be taking those measurements at different levels of your plant to really know and get a good picture of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the seedling stage, and I'm sorry, could you repeat it? You said 150 to 200 PPFD. Is that what you said? Uh, 100 to 150. 100 to 150. Okay. And then as soon as uh, you know you hit that first node, you kind of start. You just increase it just a little bit. Like, would you go from from 100 to 200, or do you, you know, just? It's a lot like um, I don't know if you've ever had to take a uh, clone that you've had in like one of the humidity domes, and mm -hmm. you really kind of have to like bring it out slowly to to build that cuticle up. It's mm -hmm. very similar with lighting. Um, you know, plants really kind of like having more of that ramp up, um, and and they'll respond much easier if you are, are slower about how how much you're bringing that intensity up. Okay, kind of like hardening off a plant from indoors to outdoors, kind of sticking it. in a filtered, shady, problem. filtered sun environment, and for a few days let it acclimate, and then before you go stick it out in the full sun. Yeah. Okay, um, and then so dialing it up. Um, is when the plant, let's say the plants, you know, third, fourth, fifth node vegetation stage, whether it's an autoflower or a photo period around what PPFD do you kind of want to get up to during the vegetation stage? Um, so if we're talking photo periods, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, 600 to, you know, 700, um, for mid veg, um, for autoflowers, I like to say closer to like four to 500, um, mm -hmm. They, they tend to, to be a little bit more sensitive earlier in that stage of growth. Um, I haven't, from my experience, found you know much benefit of you know increasing the intensity too early on them. Mm -hmm. 
And then as you're moving into like later veg, um, you know, around 800 PPFD um, for 800, 900 for photo periods, and then six, 700 for the, uh, for the autos. Okay. Yeah. See, that's important, man. So a lot of us are growing auto flowers and we're paying no attention to the fact that they might need a little bit different lighting. Um, we, a lot of us just go off of the, you know, charts for photo periods, just cannabis across the table, you know? Well, um, you know, and a lot of, um, a lot of people don't realize that additional six hours adds a lot of extra photons to that bucket that we were talking about, that total DLI. Um, you know, when, when you're calculating that DLI for a photo period, you're calculating that after 12 hours of, of light. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're looking at the manufacturer's recommendations for flowering, that's based on 12 hours of light. Well, when we're talking most autoflower growers, you know, most of us grow 18, 20, 24 hours sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so you really need to take that in consideration when you're calculating that DLI. Um, so to give you an example of like, let's say we just take a, you know, 1000 PPFD or UMO. Um, as our, our daily intensity. Mm -hmm. That 1,000 PPFD on a 12-hour cycle is around 43 moles um, per meter squared a day. That same intensity on an 18-hour cycle is 64 moles per day. So you're talking roughly an extra third more light in a day at the same exact intensity. Mm -hmm. So that, that takes into, like, there's a lot of metabolism that's happening there in that extra bit of light. Okay, so not only could we be wasting money, but we could also is now is that harmful to the plant if it's getting too much? Like uh, yeah, you know, I mean, most autoflowers, you know, late flower are are looking for anywhere from like forty to fifty max moles per day. So if you're giving them sixty four moles per day, uh, they're they're definitely going to be struggling. They're going to okay. show signs of toxicity. Um, now again. You know, if we go and we're ramping up all of our other environmental aspects, so if you're a commercial grower and you're able to, you know, supplement CO2 and you've mm -hmm. got your VPD in a much higher range and you're pushing that metabolism, you can go higher. You can push more moles per day. But for your average grower that's, you know, only using 400 ppm of CO2 from the ambient air, 40 to 50 moles a day is really all you want to be looking at. Uh, I, you know what, man? I, I think it would be safe to say that a lot of us, including myself, are blasting our auto flowers with too much light. I, I, I really think that that's what causes a lot of my issues. Maybe looking, looking back on it now, chatting with you, it's, it's making me question like, Hmm, like we were talking about earlier, did I really have like a calcium deficiency because I put so much dolomite lime and stuff in my, in my soil. And, uh, and I was even, um, supplementing with, um, a, a calcium input that I made, you know, water soluble yeah. calcium, a, a K and F input. And, uh, it was still there and it's just making me wonder if my lighting was off. Yeah. And, and it, that's probably it, more than likely what it was. You, know, you be, probably yeah. just hit a point where, you know, you're using probably limited by CO2 at that point more than anything. Um, mm. And because you're limited at that point, um, it just doesn't need to uptake any more nutrients. And because mm -hmm. you're giving that excess light, it's just metabolizing more than it, than it can. Interesting, man. Yeah, that's good stuff. So let's chat. Let's get deeper into this DLI with auto flowers versus photo periods. Because I know um, it's, it's a little bit hard to follow along for some of us. Um, I think I grasped what you were saying, but I just kind of want to dive a little bit deeper and break it down. A little sure. simpler so there's there's light intensity like you explained to us like the rain and then so the bucket is how much of that light we're catching in a whole day right at, yes now and, and to help it at that level that you're taking that measurement so mm -hmm. that bucket will change depending on where it's at in that canopy okay okay because that PPFD reading is going to change the further away from the light that you get okay well, let me ask you this then, like, so when we're, when we're measuring our PPFD, we're, we're measuring to the canopy, right? To the very top of the plants. Yeah. Okay. And then, so the, the, the flowers that are lower, um, are they going to turn out like, okay, whereas the top ones might, or is it the whole plant is acting as a whole so plant? That's where we then start getting into spectrum, um, and intensity. So mm -hmm. both will actually then start playing a role into how deep you are able to get into that canopy. Um, 
because when you're, you know, if you're talking like your typical blurple light, um, usually you're not going to get far into that canopy because the red and blues get sucked right up into that top of that canopy. Nothing gets penetrated through it. Um, whereas like if you've got light that has infrared and green, you're getting further into that canopy because it's not getting collected by the chlorophyll and chloroplast right at the top of the canopy. It's able to penetrate through, photons are bouncing around, okay. um, you're getting more canopy depth. Okay. All right. And so where a photo period, <clears throat> the typical DLI, let's say is, uh, during flower is what would you, what did you say? Like one, 800 to 1000? For the, to the, yeah, uh, for, um, a photo PPFD. period. Yeah. So I'm sorry, PPFD. Yeah. So the PPFD, um, of a photo period during flower, you're probably wanting up to like 800 to 1000. Is that what you said? Correct. And, yeah. but that is with 12 hours of light. Yes. So that's where we have to make a difference as if we're growing auto flowers is because, um, that same light intensity a lot of us are, like you said, we're running at least 18 hours of light. So yeah. like I run 18. So if I'm blasting my auto flowers that are in flower with a thousand P, uh, PPFD for 18 hours, that's a lot more light than I'm giving a photo period plant. We're yes. blasting do, do, them with do, more. Do you have a similar DLI on that auto flower that's running for 18 hours. You would have to have your PPFD somewhere around like 660. And that would be okay. then an equivalent DLI to that photo period at 1,000 PPFD at 12 hours. Okay. So both so, lights are achieving the same amount of light in a day. They're just receiving it at a different rate. Right. Okay. Um, which is something that, like I said, I feel that a lot of us are probably missing missing out on. Um, so with that, with, with during flower with an auto flower, if it, let's say, really only needs 660 PPFD uh, at 18 hours. Um, is there a difference at that point of the plant's stage as far as um, having the light lower and dimmed? Or is it better to have it high and blaring? So that's where if you have the height available to you, um, having it high, if your light has the intensity available to it. Mm -hmm. um, because like I said, if you can get your light higher, you can increase your intensity to be able to achieve that same PPFD at the canopy, right? Where if you have that, that high intensity, it's driving further into the canopy. You're producing okay. more photons total from the light and they're able to reach further into the canopy. Okay, so in a seedling stage, it's beneficial to dim it and stuff and lower it. You can, you know, save some money. You can really kind of baby your seedling and then, um, but you know, when you're up into flower and stuff, um, th that's different because of the intensity. So you're, the, the intensity of the, you don't need the intensity as a seedling to get way down inside of a canopy. Obviously, yes, you're not but, trying to you know push through leaves. You're not you know really trying to you know get through a whole lot. In the flower phase, you've got all of this canopy that you're trying to push through and get as deep into there and increase your yields as much as possible. So the higher your intensity that you can push out of that light, the more you're gonna achieve. Okay, that makes sense. So, and then with that said, um, if we don't have an accurate measuring instrument, it would just be safe to play play it off of the manufacturer's suggestions as far as, cause they'll usually give a little chart, you know, and you see all these squares and yeah. height that'll tell you at 18 inches high, the middle has 960 and then you'll see all these other things. So we could just kind of go off of that. Um, is it normal for the a middle of a, of a light to have a lot more uh, intensity than the, that's pretty yeah. normal. So, and a lot of that just, it's because of the cross patterns. So mm -hmm. because in the middle of the light, you know, those diodes are kicking out, you know, photons in all directions. So when you're in the middle of the light, all of that cross pattern is happening in the center. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to have more overlap in the center of the light than you are on the edges there. Okay. Um, and then, so could there be a huge difference between like, let's say you've got a, a pretty decent sized LED and let's say you've got three plants under it, one in the middle and two on the edges. Is that one in the middle? Do you think it's going to grow differently? And I know it's not a huge, huge, huge dramatic difference, but, uh, is it almost better to kind of keep them outside the edges? Um, you know, or? I wouldn't say it's going to be better, you know, because yeah, you are going to achieve a greater, higher PPFD out of that center plant. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you have, I get, 
let me back up. You are right in the instance of if your light is intense enough and you want to have an even distribution of that light, yes, it actually would be better to have them bordering that intensity. Um, but, you know, that, that would be taken into consideration that you're able to dial that PPFD in exactly where you want it and, mm. and that you're really dialing that system in. Um, for your average grower, um, no, you're better just to fill the space. Yeah, yeah. I guess just a logical thing, a thought that came to me would be, uh, you know, if you've got a plant that's a couple inches shorter than the other ones, throw that one in the middle. If you and want that, like a really a even, level. yeah, even yep. canopy. Um, yeah, and that's really how we try to coach our customers is we're taking a look at your garden in that way. Um, you know, this plant's short, put it in the center where that intensity is going to be a little bit uh, higher. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so let's chat about like, I know you kind of touched on it, but let's chat about like um, how to visually identify light burn, like a light being too close. I've experienced that. Uh, and the, the last grow before the one I'm doing now, um, I dropped it down pretty good. I mean, I, I dropped it down a lot and it was probably a dumb thing to do, but one of the plants, one of my plants ended up, uh, getting pretty bad. Um, could you just walk us through like maybe like some, some signs to look out for as far as light burn? Yeah, you know, there's, there's different stages of light burn um, and how it progresses. Um, so the first thing that I look for is, like we were talking before, is when, when those leaves start to, to downturn a little bit, um, and I look for the tip burn. Um, when I start seeing the tip burn towards the top of the canopy, um, that's usually a pretty good indicator to start turning those lights down. Now, if I don't catch it at that point, um, you'll start noticing from the top down, the canopy will start to yellow out. Um, and it won't look like it's like progressing, you know, very evenly, but it'll be like more towards upper canopy starts yellowing out. And then as that progresses, um, you'll start having spotting. And this is where a lot of people think they have a CalMeg deficiency when they have light toxicity because they start seeing chlorosis of the leaves, you know, they start to yellow a little bit and they start seeing spotting and they go, Oh, I've got a CalMeg deficiency. I need to supplement. Um, when a lot of times it's just looking at if it's progressing from the top down, it's usually going to be a toxicity from the light. If it's coming from the bottom up, you know, usually that's going to be more of a sign that you're running into a deficiency. Um, so it's, it's reading where the stress is happening on your plant um, and just those signs of the tip burn, the yellowing, the spotting. And then if it gets really bad, you'll just start having leaves die off. And that'll happen pretty much throughout the entire plant. Okay. Well, typically, like what color are the tip burns? Um, it's going to be more of a yellow orange, um, and it's very pronounced just at the tip. Um, mm -hmm. a lot of people can mistake it for newt burn, mm -hmm. um, and which is why you really kind of have to look throughout the plant, um, and see where it's starting, where it's progressing. Um, you know, if you're noticing that your tips are burnt from one end of the plant to the other, you know, probably a uh, nutrient burn, mm -hmm. but if it's more towards the top of your canopy, that's when you're going to be noticing signs of light toxicity. Okay. And then obviously, you know, the best thing to do is just move that light up a little bit, right? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Move that light up. Um, you know, give them a break, you know, especially if you notice that you really have kind of fried them a bit because you pushed it, you know, way too hard. Don't be afraid to kind of back that light way off a minute. Give them a chance to rebound. Um, let that metabolism catch back up. Because that's kind of what's happened. You've, you've overstressed the plant in a way that its metabolism able, isn't able to keep up. Yeah. So give it a chance, back that light off, a couple days of lower intensity, and then just slowly start bringing that light back at, back down, and it'll rebound. Okay. You know, it's interesting. Like, how come, what's the difference between an LED and the sun? Like, well, not what's the difference. I don't mean that in a literal sense. But what I mean is, like, I, I can put a plant outside in the sun, which is, I don't even know how many PPFD, something crazy intense. Um, and it does okay. But when you put it under a certain PPFD under a light, it could really get burnt. Um, why is yeah, that? Yeah, a lot of is that has to do with the, the spectrum of the sun. Um, so plants like a full balanced spectrum um, where we, you know, 10 years ago when, when you know, blurples were the thing, we kind of thought that plants used, you know, red and blue. And that was really what the, the, the only spectrum that they used. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, we found now that the plants utilize the entire spectrum. Um, and it's all about the balance and ratios that that spectrum has in it, the plant's ability to use that light. 
Um, so a lot of times where you'll start seeing things like um, buds that are bleaching is because there's too much red in abundance to the rest of the spectrum and that mm. actually causes the plant to bleach out. Um, and uh, scientifically, I don't know exactly what happens, but it's just due to an abundance of red in the plant and nothing else. Mm. Um, so the sun keeps a very well balanced spectrum. If you look at you know, a spectral map of the sun, it's pretty much a rainbow. Um, mm. you know, it doesn't have the big drops like, uh, like our lights do. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so a, a LED light that says full spectrum, does that mean that they're, your plants are getting the full same spectrum as the, as the sun or to an um, extent? Full spectrum or? can mean a couple of things. A lot of um, the terminology that we use can be a little misleading. Um, full spectrum, when you, when you hear that, is that it is not just a white spectrum LED. It's not a narrow band spectrum. It is a full band spectrum, meaning it's got everything in the you know, 400 to 700 nanometer range um, that we consider PAR, photoactive radiation. Um, so that is a little misleading because full spectrum doesn't necessarily mean the entire spectrum is full from top to bottom. It just means that it carries the entire spectrum. In kind of what's, what's needed by a plant. Not necessarily what's in and the sun or... Also, what, what is most efficient to produce. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that a lot of growers are experiencing light toxicity right now for is that for years, we were told that light was the limiting factor. More light, more light, more light. You couldn't get enough light. Well, now LEDs have hit an efficiency level that light is no longer the limiting factor. You know, mm -hmm. We can get plenty of light out of these lights now to where we're learning a new aspect of indoor lighting. And that's where it's really exciting now to see a lot of these manufacturers like Samsung is up investing heavily into horticulture lighting. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. It, I think it's, it's, I love being able to grow indoors um, because in the summer it gets really, really hot here. And while I can grow some plants outdoors, um, it, it is a struggle for some plants and cannabis is one of them. I mean, there's days where it'll get up to hundred and 15 here you know during Whew. the summer so i mean that's not normal but it is normal for it to be 103 105 for a few yeah. months here um so i i like the idea of growing indoors and of course just the pest control you know every time i grow outdoors i get <clears throat> it's just inevitable i get a i just struggle with aphids mostly yeah, aphids. you're out you're out in the world i mean you're, you're exposed yeah. to everything that point. yeah which is okay i mean they're controllable to where you can still get a harvest and stuff but it's so clean indoors you know and there's just yeah. there's something about it too when you unzip a tent and you have this artificial lighting and these plants coming up it's just gives you a certain feeling <laughs> oh absolutely well and for me too like i love growing outdoors don't get me wrong the, the turf profile and everything like that there's there's something that's wonderful about that but you know you don't get the same calyx development it's not as tight um you know you get a little bit more leaf development and especially when you're talking plants like autoflowers and stuff like that you know you want that tighter calyx development mm -hmm. um so some of the indoor growing I, I feel like you get a better product sometimes yeah yeah i would agree it's de definitely um definitely cleaner too kind of just to bounce off what i was just saying yeah. um but yeah, I, I, the technology is crazy, man. How much it's uh, how much it's it's evolving so quickly. You know, like you were saying, like when I first got into growing five five and a half years ago, um, I bought a Blurple because that's what everybody was buying, a Viper Spectra or whatever it was. You know, these cheap Blurples off of Amazon, and uh, they grew plants, um, but I de they definitely weren't they they were pretty larfy and pretty fluffy and stuff like that. And it was all about the red and blue. You know, I remember yeah. hearing that, you know, oh, just use this in veg and this in flower. You don't even need that over here. And you don't even yeah, need that over here. probably had the switches on it. You can turn one off. Yeah, and the, other yeah, one the on veg and up. bloom switches and stuff like yeah. that. And now it's kind of like you're saying it's more, uh, I guess science is, is discovering, you know, that that's not necessarily how it works. Yeah, well, you know, because we're not chasing that efficiency rating anymore. You know, we're not trying to, to push the how, how much photon we can push out of this diode. It's now... You know what is the spectral map that we can get to be reproduced here and that's where we're th seeing things like our company um, when we started with infrared that, that's something that we, we really lean heavy into mm -hmm. um, you know we found things that you get broader leaf development um, if you have a specific infrared to green ratio you can actually get the lower canopy branches to start moving up to the top of the canopy due to the biological signaling that happens there hmm. um, so now that we're starting to hit that limit 
it's pushing science in the other direction. We're st- having to to look at these other aspects, and it's exciting. I, it, there's a lot happening right now. Um, there is a diode that's being produced right now in the in the UV range that is able to mitigate, you know, things like mildews and bacteria and things like that mm. just throughout the grow process. Is that right? That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. There's all. It's it's weird how we're. You know, we consider ourselves to be kind of in this um, time, in this age where, you know, we're so smart and we know everything. And then, but when it, when it, as things develop, it, it's like the lighting, like it's, oh, we're finding it out now this and the science is actually changing. And the same with soil biology, you know, just, yeah. I mean, just the microbial life and especially with, with fungi and stuff, you know, just the, the, we still don't even know that much, really. I mean, when you yeah. really get into this stuff, it's like, wow, there's so much for us to learn when it comes to natural processes that exist upon our planet, you know, that we're a part of. I mean, we're part of that process. And it's just so yeah. cool to tap into this and to kind of tune it in and create these indoor environments like we do and and uh, just understanding how it all works, you know, and being able to use that to our benefit to grow plants, to grow food, medicine, yeah, you know, whatever. Well, right? I, I don't know about you, but I mean, if you've dived down the rabbit hole of living soil like I have, I mean, microbes are so much a part of that. And I've learned more about my own, you know, biome by, by learning about these plants and how they interact with the, the microbes and the fungi and all of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the more you dive into that, the more you realize it is way more complex than we understand. Oh, and man. anybody that tells you they have a complete understanding of it is bullshitting you from end to yeah. end. Um, so yeah, it's, it, we're learning new things every day. Um, and it's, it's an exciting field to be in. Yeah. It's super cool, man. Um, tell me a little bit about, uh, do you mind if we chat about your lights for a minute? Um, yeah. that, that you guys offer, I know you, you came on just as you know, informational and stuff, but, um, I want to chat about your lights. Um, in particular, maybe the ES-180 and the ES-300, those are two lights that seem to be um, a pretty pretty good lights from what I understand from outside sources, uh, really good lights um, for uh, the home grower that are, um, you know, budget friendly, but a really, really decent light, not to butter you yeah, up on no, here, but no, if, yeah, if you could tell um, me a little bit about your guys' lights. Yeah, you, well, you, you mentioned one of the focuses that we had when we were designing this light was home growers. Um, th- this was designed to be a home grow light. And we took a lot of, what of the, some of the things that I was talking about earlier into consideration. Um, canopy penetration, spectrum, all of those things. Because, you know, home growers are limited on the amount of space they have. So to be able to yield in a smaller space is very important. Um, you know, you're not able to, to spread out across an entire warehouse and, and really take advantage of that. So canopy penetration is going to be the most important thing. Um, and that's really where our light kind of focuses. So we have focal lenses that drive the, the light down into the canopy. Um, so you're getting better penetration. You're not having light loss out the sides. Um, kind of like that cross pattern that I was talking about earlier mm-hmm. towards the center there. You don't get that quite as much. It's a much more even stretch across that canopy. Um, the other thing we have is we initiate something that's called the Emerson effect. Um, a lot of people don't realize that infrared is actually a turbocharger for photosynthesis. Um, plants have two photosystems in them. Photosystem one is going to be anything that is in our typical power range. That's, you know, 400 to 700 nanometers. Photosystem two is anything 700 and above. That's the infrared range. And what that is, is essentially is the turbocharger to the system. It's the photosystem one splits off an electron, um, sends it to photosystem two, and then photosystem two uses that electron to essentially turbocharge photosynthesis and allows the plant to metabolize faster. Um, Mm. So it kind of goes to that plant absorption that we talked about. That allows the plant to be able to absorb more light faster than it typically would in its ambient situation. Um, so that's really what kind of sets our light apart from a lot of the competitors is that we focused on spectrum as well as efficiency. Um, and with that, we've seen higher terpenes, um, more, um, better, uh, node spacing, uh, broader leaves, um, all around just better plant health. Okay. Are you guys kind of fo- focused in on the cannabis industry or, 
are you guys just kind of like across? Yeah, the I mean that, that's our that's our main focus. Okay. Um, you know, obviously we we've um, had quite a few different operations using our lights. Um, we have several uh, actually uh, government agencies that are currently using them. Um, we have a research project in Antarctica currently using our lights, um, which okay. is pretty cool. Um, the a few that I you know I don't necessarily want to list off just because I don't know if uh, you know what the sure uh, crossing any lines there. Um, but yeah, no, we, our lights are utilized in all sorts of different practices, but, um, our focus, like I said, is home growers. That's, that's yeah. where we, that's we awesome, man. Yeah. And I just love, um, I just want to say this carefully, you know, like, I, I just, I like that, um, that it's American, that, that it's, it's, it's American, um, made and that it's, um, that you're able to speak with somebody who's you know, speaks English. I don't mean that in a, we were chatting before we hit record, you know, yeah, I don't mean no, that in, in a negative way. I just, it's nice to be able, if you purchase something, especially if you're investing a few hundred dollars into something um, and you have issues, it's really nice to be able to just freely be able to communicate and contact. And, and, and you know, I noticed like with a lot, most of the other popular companies, um, my own experience in, in particular is that there's been a pretty big communication barrier and uh so it's just it's nice to have just open communication with somebody like yourself who um you know you you grow cannabis you um you know you 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 guys are, are hands on with this stuff you're helping customers you're chatting about this stuff and it's not just kind of a it's a business but it's not kind of just business for for the business there's some uh, relationship happening there with you and your customers i appreciate that and so kudos to you guys uh you know for, yeah for no, we, we really appreciate that as well because you know it's still a job and you know and at the end of the day anything that makes that job more enjoyable is going to be better and being able to make it fun and like i said helping customers get to those harvests i mean there's nothing more enjoyable for a grower than being able to enjoy that that harvest so when you're able to share in that excitement every day, I mean, it's just fun. And yeah. that's what we try to make it about is, you know, like you said, we're, we're growers. If you call into us, you're going to talk to a grower using the same products that you're asking questions about. It's not going to be mm -hmm. you know, some engineer that's just trying to work off a, you know, troubleshooting list. We're going to work with you with the exact problem that you're dealing with then. And if we can help you, we will. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, I think that's great, man. And uh, I think we're about running to the end of our time here. But um, if you could just give us your info, I'll put it all in the show notes as well. But if you could just, you know, give us an info on to where uh, we could find you guys online, social media. Um, so you can find us at our website. Um, it's going to be thegreensunshineco.com. Um, we're also on Instagram at the.green.sunshine.co. Um, as well as YouTube and Facebook. Um, so you can find us any of those locations. Um, my, my personal Instagram is at the underground gardens. So you can always reach out to me personally as well. Um, so I answer any customers questions there too. Um, but yeah, you can, you can email us, call us at any point. We're, we're here to, to help answer your questions. Awesome, man. Well, thank you, David. I greatly appreciate it, man. I'll link all that in the show notes so people could just click on it as well. Um, but thank you so much for coming on here, giving us your time, talking to us, um, scratching the surface about lighting. I'm sure I'll probably end up getting quite a bit of questions. Um, and if I do, maybe we'll just do a round two and uh, have yeah, you back that'd be great. on. I man. appreciate you having me on. I always love being able to talk and uh, discuss lighting. So. Awesome, man. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. I hope you got as much out of that as I did. I know that nugget about the lighting and the DLI with autoflowers was pretty huge for me. But thank you for tuning in. Be sure to check out the Green Sunshine Company. All of the links are in the show notes. I appreciate you guys. Much love and happy growing. See ya. Nicotine, alcohol, good drugs. Coincidentally, tax drugs. Ooh, how does this fucking work? The dried leaves and berries are ground up and made into cigarettes by a simple hand machine. The deadly narcotic is thus quickly and easily prepared for its market. The sale of marijuana is even more difficult to detect and halt than the traffic in drugs such as opium, morphine, and heroin.